Got that rifle and your gun belts. Driver, climb down and unload the shipment. You keep your hands up. It's faster than last time. Not good enough. I put the bags back on the coach. All right, get your hands up, all of you. How about hunting table venison? Looks like I found something bigger than that. You made a mistake, Sheriff. We're not hold up men. We've got a claim over the hill. We're sending ore samples to Virginia City for assay. My name is Fillmore. Jameson Fillmore, Chef. Ore? Those don't look like ore bags to me. Reverend, kneel down and open up those bags for the Sheriff. Show him. He's dead. You and your rehearsals. You fixed it this time, Fillmore. You wrecked it. Good. You're getting old, Testy. You're losing your nerve. You do exactly as I tell you. Take the deputy, put him in the coach, tie the horse behind him. You saw him on a lonely road, and you're taking him into Virginia City like the good citizens that you are. <laughs> Just might work. It'll work. You're right, that's gonna work. But if we do get our hands on that currency shipment, we've got the Ponderosa to cross, posses everywhere, and the best trackers in Nevada on our trail. You're losing faith in me, Reverend. Oh, no, no. But I spent four years in prison, and I'm not particularly anxious to go back. Reverend, you're gonna go on preaching the gospel to these poor lost souls until I tell you to stop. For your information, there won't be any trails to follow. Because we're going straight across Lake Tahoe. And we're going to do it in Ben Cartwright's brand new boat. Boat 7,000 feet in the sky. And we're going to use it on the biggest holdup ever pulled. Once a week, I understand. I mean, next Sunday. What about next Sunday, Julie? We're going to be a picnic and a dance and a barn raising over at the old beer ranch. Candy's going and horse and Joe and, and just everybody. I expect there'll be a few who'll miss the happy occasion. I know you're awful busy with freight shipments practically doubling every month, but even so. Julie, do you realize that this is the greatest opportunity a sailor ever had? There's room on Lake Tahoe for a whole fleet to open up this new country. With the help of God and Ben Cartwright, we could be part of it. I know, but... That's in the future. And you're worried about the present. <laughs> Julie, I think we can go to that party. Oh. I'll take the wheel. I'm sure that uh, your social activities will take up a lot of time. Thank you, Papa.
Captain Larson's got a right on time. Pretty as a $40 cold, ain't she? A little bit different from some of them clipper ships you sail, huh, Paul? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, she's gonna be all right. Till we get some good roads, that's the best way to carry heavy freight around here. She'll pay away and then some. No passengers permitted. Good afternoon, Captain. When did you come aboard? Oh, I hopped aboard just before you left the South Shore. You were, uh, you were busy, Nels. Nice. Almost as big as the place we once shared together for so long. Cell 241. Cell Block D, in case you've forgotten. What do you want? An introduction to Ben Cartwright. I am Jameson Fillmore, lumberman from San Francisco. Just introduce you. Is that all? That's all. I'll think about it. Get out. Let me dock this ship. Think, Eddie. It's a good thing I'm running that cow camp instead of you. If you throw that rope, I don't think you'd catch anything but a cold. Not a rope, landlubber. It's a line. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm. Pop and I will make a sale out of you yet, Candy. I wouldn't count on that, Julia. I still can't make a cow hand out of him. Why? He handled the boat practically all by himself last three times. Three trips. Only hit the dock twice. That's one out of three. That's not too bad. <laughs> don't try to explain my skills to him, Julie. He's jealous because I get to spend so much time with you. Hey, wait for me, Captain Kid. I'll give you a hand. Thanks a lot. Julie? Hi. Well, Nels, <laughs> have a good trip? Fine, fine. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Cartwright. Got the mail, huh? Good. Yeah. I'm afraid there's uh, bad news in the paper. A friend of yours, wasn't he? Yes, he was a friend of mine. Nels, did you hear anything around the lake? No, sir, not a thing. This is shocking. I tell you, this is just terrible. I heard about this yesterday on the South Shore. What is this country coming to when even the officers of the law can't ride the roads in safety? That's what a lot of people are wondering, sir. Uh, Mr. Cartwright, this is Mr. Jameson Fillmore, the lumberman from San Francisco. Fillmore? How do you do, Mr. Cartwright? Yes, sir. Cartwright, owner of the Ponderosa Ranch and this fine stern wheeler? That's right. Well, that's quite an achievement, launching a ship this big so high in the mountains. Well, Mr. Fillmore, I consider it a great achievement. And I can say that because I had nothing to do with the building or the launching of it. It was brought up piece by piece on mule back, right up the side of the mountain. Hmm. By the man who had the vision to do it. I merely bought it from him. Are you in the lumber business, are you, sir? Yes, I am. And I've spent a great deal of time up here in Lake Tahoe and... Beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. Frankly, when I saw your bare ridge stand of timber, I said to myself, I have just got to have it. <laughs> so I took the liberty of bringing along two of my top timber cruisers. <laughs> you don't waste any time, do you, sir? And with your permission, I'd like to have them cruise that stand of timber. And after I get their reports, I'd like to be able to make you an offer that you cannot refuse. <laughs> I find no objection in that, sir. Good. Uh, we'll need some uh, pack animals and some uh, horses and a place to camp. No problem at all. You'll be wanting to start immediately. Yes, we will. <laughs> Nels, now there is an enthusiastic gentleman. Business is picking up. You made that introduction sound legitimate, Nels. Real legitimate. Understand one thing. I won't see Cartwright hurt. You make one wrong move and I'll tell him. You and all your men are ex-convicts. 
Well, you say anything and you'll go back for consorting with ex-convicts. You know, uh, I was thinking, Nels, maybe uh, there's some way I can help you raise enough money to send Julie back east to school. As I remember, that's all you used to talk about when we were roommates in apartment 214. Think about it. Everything you've ever wanted. of the grade, the Reverend will be waiting in the middle of the road. We stop at the stagecoach, take out the currency. Remember this time, it's a million dollars. We load it into the Reverend's bag among his hymn books and his religious tracts. Well spoken, brother. Now, when the law hears about the holdup, they'll block the trail. They'll search the area, even for days. Yeah. Testy, what do you do? We go right for the North Shore boat landing across this hogback, down this draw, because that's the fastest, and then in that boat of Cartwright's better be there. Dixie will be there, because Fillmore and me are going to make sure. Reverend? I ride through North Meadows. If I meet somebody, I start thumping my Bible. It's a posse. I tell them I saw three riders headed away from the lake into these mountains. You're forgetting something, Reverend. Something absolutely essential. You do not hurry. You are a preacher with all the time in the world. I don't sweat. I don't strain. I don't lather my horse. And if you ever again raise your hand against me, I'll kill you. I'll do my job. And I'll make it look good. Good? Perfect. Every man, every move. Mail off the boat. Paul around? Yeah, he's in there. You got some for me? No, Joe, nobody loves you, I reckon. Of course, anybody loves you couldn't read and write no oil. Oh, you're funny. You're funny. <laughs> Are you there from San Francisco? No, nothing. Why, you expect you something? Oh, I wrote to the bank in San Francisco for some references on Mr. Fillmore. Although I don't really think we need any. He seems to be a gentleman, and he certainly knows the lumbering business. Well, maybe he knows it. I don't think too much of the fellows that work for him, though. Very hard to find good workers these days. You know, Hoss, even in the bosom of one's own family, it's difficult to find a hard-working young man. wrong, nothing. Why do you ask? Papa, what are you worried about? Honey, I'm just doing some heavy thinking, that's all. Anything I can do? You already have. All the time that I was in prison, I think I might have given up and died if I hadn't known the two people on the outside believed in my innocence. You and Ben Cartwright.
just talking about you. Step down. Say hello. What do you want? Settle a wager. You know, we sit up here all day watching all the activities down on the water. And who should we see an hour ago getting on a horse, riding away from the dock? But our old colleague, Nels. And where should he be heading? But on the only road leading to Ben Cartwright's logging camp. I work for him. I can talk to anyone I want. But not say anything you want, Nels. So you finally decided to be a hero. Throw caution to the winds. Warn Mr. Cartwright, huh? No. No, sir. No, not anything like that. You told me that you're not planning anything. I believe you. I believe all of you. Yeah, we're... We're old friends. We've been through the mill together. Why should any one of us hurt anybody? Where's Papa? I haven't seen him. Well, he was only going to be gone an hour. I took a nap, and when I woke up, I... Well, we're due to sail in 20 minutes, and Papa's never late. Well, he and Ben Cartwright probably got to talk and forgot the time. I'll ride up there and meet him, if it'll make you feel better. No, that's all right. I'll do it. you got to get the Dixie ready to sail. You're the captain now, right? Right. <laughs> We're so worried about you. Ten minutes before sailing time, and you sit here resting? Hey, Papa! Papa! Please! <laughs> Papa loves the lake. He... He'd like it here. I still can't believe it. Julie. It's going to be hard. And the loneliness, that'll be the hardest part. Found plenty of tracks, but lost them up in the shale. It still looks like attempted robbery. I think the killer saw him riding up the trail and thought he was bringing you the money for your loggers. It's possible. I don't think it was robbery. Nels Larson had been carrying around a big load of trouble. He was jumpy, nervous. Not himself at all. How long had that been going on? A week. Maybe he was sick or something. No, it was more than that. At least, I think it was. You know what he wanted to see me about? He didn't tell me. He didn't even tell Julie. If you hear anything, tell me or Clem. Meanwhile, you're the skipper. Julie, you don't have to do that. I'll take care of it. No. I have to. You have a lot of friends, Julie. We'll be glad to help. I know that. My, my aunt says I can come and live with her in St. Louis. And, and I'll go to boarding school. And, and I know I'll make a lot of new friends. And... And all the haters. Oh, why could Why did he have to be killed? What was it? What kind of trouble was he in? Julie, I don't know who killed your father or why. But I'm going to find out. Or die trying.
Howdy. Uh, you mind if I come in? It uh, looks like you are in. Hey, that's too bad about Captain Larson. Ironic, isn't it? Killed for a payroll that he wasn't even carrying. Hey, notice you got your gun on. Yeah, I felt kind of out of balance without it. And a nervous little man with banker written all over his face handed you a pouch at the dock. If I were a betting man, I'd say uh, today was payday. You know, funny you should mention payroll. When I was a kid, I used to read about robbers. I used to try to figure out how I could do it better. <laughs> and since I've been working for Larson, I bet I've figured a dozen different ways to steal that payroll. Just to pass the time. Just to pass the time. Yeah, sure. Uh, stealing it would be a cinch, but uh, well, getting away with it's a tough part. But I just might figure out a way to do it. Just to pass the time. Well, I'll have to, um, I'll have to give that some thought myself. Just to pass the time. Sit down, share a meal with us. Meat's tough, biscuits are like lead, but the coffee's hot. Have uh, you thought any more about what we were talking about? Well, as a matter of fact, I have. Wow, looks like payroll day. Bringing it this far was easy. Now you tell me how to get away with it. What's in it for me? Half. Sorry, I don't trust you. It's all too quick, too easy. I think you're a big bag of hot air. I think you have no idea how I can get away with that. Your privilege, my friend. But I know how to do it. Go ahead. I need your help. A robbery. Somebody took it away from me. Hmm? <laughs> Wouldn't believe you for a minute. I think they will. If they find me with a lump on my head and one of the robbers beside me, dead. And just where do you think you're going to get yourself a dead robber? Which one of those two can you spare? You're not serious. Which one? The one in the green coat. Houston. He drinks too much anyway. My congratulations, boy. My sincere congratulations. How would you like to make four times what's in that payroll bag with no risk at all? Four times? Four times. I'm listening very carefully. Just take that payroll bag to the Cartwright camp like you're supposed to. What? Then go back to the boat, stay there, do your job until you hear from me. All right. I guess I just have to trust you, don't I? He's a real hard-nosed one. About as friendly as a porcupine. How right you are, Houston. How right you are. Just doing open. It's all there. I opened it when I offered Fillmore half the payroll. You what? Offered Fillmore half the payroll. I think you heard him right the first time, Paul. All right. 
You start talking, you better start from the beginning. Yeah, I better. Julie and me have done some hard thinking. And we're sure that her dad's trouble started when Fillmore showed up. What's that got to do with this payroll? Well, Fillmore's been feeling me out for a week. I set up stealing the payroll to test him. And I offered him half. Well, young man, don't you think you ought to consult with me before you start doing anything like that? Well, as it turned out, Mr. Carrey, there wasn't time. If I'd have brought this up here before I went to Fillmore's camp, he'd have known I was setting a trap. But he didn't take the money, did he? No, he's after something bigger. He offered me four times this amount if I go back to the Dixie and wait for orders. Paul, don't you think it's about time we get the law in on this? What's the law got to do with it? There's no evidence. All we've got is Candy's suspicions. I want to turn that suspicion into evidence. I'd like to go back to the boat and wait. All right, we're going. Candy, you be careful. I'll be careful. that rifle and your gun bills. Driver, climb down and unload the shipment. Hurry up! Fillmore tell you to do that? He told me, Reverend. He told me we don't need him anymore. Well, don't try it with me, Testy. I don't surprise so easily. Besides, I'm much faster than you are. Maybe. And one of these days, you might just have to prove that, Reverend. What happened, brother guy? You got a lame horse? Why, no, brother Foster. I'm just relieving him of his burden. Same as I lift the burdens of sin from the hearts of men. Anything wrong? Plenty. Stage hold up. Double killing. Oh, there's a heap of evil loose in this world, brothers. That's why I preach. Brother. I have seen the Sodoms and the Gomorrahs of the West. All the dens of iniquity. Can any of you stand without shame before the Almighty? Brother, we haven't got time for a sermon right now. But uh, no offense. How long have you been on the trail? Well, I left Virginia City early this morning. I've just been moseying along, enjoying God's wonders, and the comfort of his word. You seen anybody? Anybody at all? 
Well, I did see three riders about an hour ago. As soon as they saw me, they lit out for that peak yonder like... Thanks, brother guy. All right, let's go. Let's go. Like the devil himself was chasing him. You're all invited to the big revival I'm holding down at the South Shore. <laughs> Probably our timber cruising. Unless they can make a boundary without a compass. That's right. Mr. Fillmore? Wow. Ready to cast off, Captain? We're ready to go in about five, six minutes. It'll be a little longer than that. We're waiting for some passengers. Remember. Four times the money was in that pouch. And today's the day you earn it. Sorry, folks, we have engine trouble. Everybody ashore. We'll give a whistle blast when the engine's fixed. Shouldn't take too long. you brothers nicely done where's Fillmore up in the wheelhouse Captain, let's get this tub underway. Cartwright's boat. Don't you think it's about time I knew what was going on? Boy, you just became part of one of the biggest holdups in the history of Nevada. How much? A million. <laughs> they can run until they drop. They'll never catch us. Well, what do we do when we get to the South Shore? We don't. We turn into a cove before we get there. There's a man waiting with saddles and pack horses. Beyond that, the Placerville stage. Drivers bought and paid for. From there, 
to San Francisco. And then a boat to Panama. How does that sound? Great. I've never been to Panama. <laughs> I like your style, boy. We're gonna get along fine. Phil Moore, you better come down. Found something you ought to see. She was hiding. We missed her when we run the others off. It's the young lady's misfortune that she's here. Of course, it's our good fortune that Tahoe is the deepest lake in the world. 1,600 feet straight down. What's that fool doing? He's trying to run our ground. Gun, or the girl dies. Houston, tell Tessie to start the engines and get us out of here. Guy, come up here. You better be careful of that thing. It may be real. No! <laughs> Little girl.
charge of that boat, we're running right into their rifle fire. Cover me. Give me some running room. Joe, they'll kill you the minute you set foot on that deck. Not if I go in under the bow. Take her from behind where they won't be looking. All right, wait. What do I give you the word? Hush! Two more down below. Get his gun. Son? I have sinned grievously. Will you forgive me? Will you be merciful and forgive? Oh, Lord! Help this poor sinner to repent! Lead him back to the paths of righteousness! Now, no, son, you can't... You can't fault a man for trying to save his neck. Now, can you? Remember now, we have an agreement. You have to write a letter once a week, mm -hmm. and you have to keep your grades up, and you have to spend your summer vacations on the Ponderosa. Oh, I'll sure try, Mr. Cartwright. I'll be writing to Julie to tell you how things are on the lake. Oh, horse. Candy? I'm sorry you're not going to be around to make a sailor out of me. <laughs> hey! Come on, all you land lovers, get ashore. We're heading for the south end of this lake to meet the stage. Well, that being the case, Candy, if I'm going to make a cowboy out of you again, we better get started. That's a hurry. I got 10 minutes left on my lunch hour. And you got 20 miles to ride to where you work is, so you better start slapping leather. <laughs> Julie, you have a good trip now. Mm-hmm. 
Bye-bye. Bye, Julie. Bye. Bye. Must be your fine lad. Ah, yes, they are. Mr. Owen P. Dugan of New York City, meet my son, Hoss. Happy right. to have you here, sir. Little Joe. Pleasure to have you with us. We've heard a lot about you. And right yeah. behind him is the finest cook in the West, Hopsig. Now, I don't know if uh, Mr. Dugan owns Manhattan Island outright or just holds a long term lease on it. <laughs> <laughs> if I told you how long I'd known your father, you might discover he's been lying about his age. <laughs> <laughs> get Mr. Dugan's right, bag. It's <laughs> a very impressive place. Our home is your home. Stay a lifetime. It's just possible I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the wild, wild days. It's a shame. I tell you, lads, whenever there was trouble, you know, and, a, and a man needed a friend, there your father would be, like a tiger, like a tiger in the streets. <laughs> well, don't pay too much attention to what he says. Every second word he utters is pure blarney. Am I saying too much? Am I giving away some state <laughs> secrets? No, I am surprised that he has never told you about his youthful adventures, you know. Well, if only to educate you oh, no. along historic... What's the matter? Mm -hmm. And along oh. cultural lines, Come huh? You know, it's funny because Paul's always been very quick with that cultural stuff, hasn't he, Joe? Oh, yeah. Of course, there may have been some cultural aspects that happened to slip their <laughs> mind, Paul. Some you didn't happen to mention to us. Oh, well, just let me tell you something. I'm not going to allow myself to be blackmailed in my own home by a wild, imaginative, loose-tongued Irishman. <laughs> well, you're lucky because we're going to have to turn in. we got to get up early. Yep. See you in the morning. Only good night. Good morning. Night only. Good night, Bob. Good night. Good night. I'm not fool with Tiger in street. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two fine lads. You're a lucky man. Baby. Oh, I know it. I know it. Tell me about your daughter, Julie. I was hoping you'd ask. I tell you one thing. She is her mother, born again. Oh. Isn't she? Hmm? Oh my. She's beautiful, honey. Beautiful. And she's living in San Francisco. Yes, I sent her there to school after her mother passed away. That's nine years ago. Mm. St. Rose's Academy, and now she's at the College of Sacred Heart. Well. And she is a lady to her fingertips. You haven't seen her in all this time? No, I was all mixed up, you know, with my factories and steel mills and shipping interests. That's the way life goes, what with one thing or another. And that is why I'd like to settle here in the West. Not to be sitting on the poor girl's doorstep, exactly. But to be reasonably near in case she needed me. Like this area, for example. You know what I'd like? I'd like to invest in a business of some sort. Around here? Yes, like a racetrack in Carson City. Well, you know what I've always dreamed of doing? What? To own and operate the biggest saloon in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, you'd make a fortune. <laughs> Only, I think your ideas are just a little too rich for people around here. Oh, there's some very good investments around here, very practical investments that could be made. Are you really serious? You see that bag over there? Huh? I'm at least that serious. You don't think I carry this bag around with me because I'm afraid somebody will steal my laundry, do you? There is $114,000 in this bag. It's the proceeds from a little brewery I sold in Boston. 
You're not joking. Oh, I never make that expensive a joke. Won't you take this and invest it for me? Me invest that for you? Oh, wait a minute. But I don't get the problem. We're both businessmen. I've been here for eight or nine hours. I've talked with both of your sons. It's as clear to me as a cow in a teacup that you are the number one citizen of Virginia City, and you're a man so honest that it hurts all over. And what is the most important thing of all is, after all, you're my closest and my best friend. So, well? Now, look, only I... I have never been comfortable using other people's money, investing people. But I, I couldn't do it. I, I wouldn't know how to... There is a... There's a very good thing around here. I think we might be interested in this. What do you know about lumber? Yes, it comes from trees. <laughs> but... <laughs> oh, no, be serious now. No, there's a, a piece of land, a, a lumber tract, which I have an option on, and I refrained from exercising the option on it. I didn't want to spread myself too thin. Now, if you're really serious about investing $100,000... Let's start. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute now, Oni. This is your money we're talking about, not mine. Now, you, you've got to know everything about this kind of operation. Now, if we were talking about entering into a pawn shop, say, in the Bowery, well, then I'd expect you to take my advice. But here we are in your territory, and I'd be only too eager and too proud to take your advice. As simple as that? As simple as that. We're in business, right? <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> I guess we're in business, right? <laughs> take it, count it, and put it in the safe. Only I... Right! <laughs> what was your name? Stakes. Stuck in a rightly or yet. So, what was your name? Ah, good morning, Hop Singh. I'm sorry that I'm late for breakfast. That's all right, Mr. Tukin. Five more minutes, you late for dinner, too. <laughs> well, that's the wasteful, sinful habits of a lifetime. There's nothing you can do about it now. Where's everybody? Mr. Cartwright just come back from town. He in kitchen. Sit down. I'm fixing dinner. Very good. Well, yeah, you're not much of a family for lounging around in the morning, are you, Ben? I uh, can't afford to. I just came from town. I just put you in the lumber business. Lock, stock, and $100,000 worth. Well, <laughs> oh, I listen. never... There's a telegram for you. Me? Hmm? Say... That's from Julie. She's coming here to Virginia City. Well, that's great news. What's the matter, Ollie? Aren't you pleased? Well, of course I am. It's just that I have no recollection of writing the lass and telling her that I was going to stop here on my way to San Francisco. Oh, but I... Did I remember now? I must be losing my memory in my old age. It's a very happy day for me, Ben. Oh, it's a happy day for all of us. Dinner is served. Come on, let's eat. Now, Ben, after dinner, you know what I like? To, I, I, I like to take a ride up and and uh, look at my investment. Well, I'll ride up with you. No, if you'll just show me the way. I, I'd like to go alone. I suddenly got a bit of thinking to do. All right. There you are. Ah, well, if it isn't a respectable member of the organization, only himself. Come in, come in. Greetings, children. Have you gotten any leads on putting some of the boodle into an honest business? That's why they sent me here, isn't it? I'm a silent partner in the lumber business with an old friend, Ben Cartwright. Fine, fine. We've heard the name mentioned since we've been here. He's a respected man. Listen, I'm going to see to it that his name stays respected. You'll do what you're told. And don't forget it. Don't threaten me, lad. I have a short Celtic temper. I'm not threatening you, only. But if you want your daughter to find out what you've been doing all these years, well, that's up to you. So it was you that sent her that telegram. Ah, just following orders, only. Just following orders. Like you will. Am I right? Yes, you're right, lad. We'll expect another report soon. He'll stay in line.
have something like this. Well, you know, you get used to the dust and everything. That's <sighs> great. Well, it's good for your lungs. <laughs> The New York as we once knew it is changing. Is it not? For example, you remember Brooklyn? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, certainly. Now there's talk of one day making Brooklyn a part of New York City. Really? Yes, it's as clear a case of joining a silk purse to a sow's ear as ever I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> ah, look at that. to be lying to me. But thanks just the same. Any fool knows when his time is gone. Now you just be quiet. Drink some of this. It's like it's like the Lord told Lucifer, you can't win them all. That's not a direct quotation, but I think it'll serve. Now just stop your talking. Be quiet. No, I'm afraid I, I have to talk. There's something you should know. I am a man that is not worth your friendship. As I am a scoundrel and a cheat. The money I gave you, it was never my own. It was booty and graft from Tammany Hall. And it was my job, you know, to, to invest it. One miserable bag of it with someone I, I could trust. Somebody who would make it seem legitimate. I don't despise me. It's my deathbed. You know, if, it's true, but if I had my life to live over again, I'd be a different man, I tell you that. It's too late. I'm... I'd like to postpone this, I tell you. As I had grand plans for my funeral. And I used to think, I used to think I'd have six black horses to haul the poor skin and bones that was left of me through the streets of New York. Promise me something. You promise me there won't be one word about my sins to, to Julie. I promise. Thank you. I'll do the same for you someday. man, Ben. Bullet didn't even reach a vital area. I think he's more scared than hurt. But give him some good care and rest, I think he'll be back on his feet in no time. Well, he'll get that. Good night. Good night, Doc. Thanks. Thank you. Come in. What's that for? I think you know. Oh, it's a terrible and humiliating thing for any man to survive his deathbed confession. 
Only I can't use that money. Why can't you use it? Because I can't. It's not as though you stole it yourself. If I used that money, it would be exactly as if I'd stolen it myself. Oh, Ben, for heaven's sakes. When you thought you were dying, I heard you say with my own ears that you wished you had a chance to live your life over again. I did. Well, you have your chance now. How? What? Now, I, I don't want to be a conscience. But the thought occurred to me that if you really wanted another chance, you'd give back that money. <laughs> you know, that that is the maddest statement that I've ever heard in my life. Why? Well, in the first place, politics is politics. And then no decent man would ever betray his fellow thief. And besides, it's not so easy as all that, you know. You can't look a crooked dollar in the face and you say, oh, this dime belongs to that construction job and this 15 cents belongs to the other. It's all mixed up. It's all part of the system. And then in the long run, what does it matter? Well, it matters to me. Now, Ben, look, this lumber deal is already underway and Haas is up there right this very minute. That's right. Well, you need the money. Yes, I do. Ben, my little girl Julie will be here in a few days. Yeah? And you won't allow any of this to make any difference with Julie, will you? Well, what do you think? Why, I, I think that you know she's the only good and decent thing in my life. And that I'd sooner die, for real, you know, than give her one moment of heartache. Dugan? Miss Julie Dugan? Yes. I'm Joe Cartwright. I've come to meet you. Well, you must be Ben Cartwright's son. That's How right. good of you to meet me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Where's father? Oh, uh, your, uh, your father's waiting for us at the house. He, he had sort of an accident. Is he all right? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's fine. He's fine. We were a little worried about him for a time. He's up and around now like a nervous rooster. We almost had to tie him down to keep him home. I can hardly wait to see him. Well, my pa's over taking care of some business. I'll get your luggage down, and as soon as he gets back, we'll be on our way. Just sit over there and rest yourself. Let me have that bag, Charlie. I signed this contract with you in good faith, Mr. Cartwright. Now, it was my understanding that I'd get my $100,000 today. You're absolutely correct, Mr. Gibbon. I'm trying to explain to you. An unforeseen circumstance has arisen, and I must ask you for a slight extension so that I can raise the money elsewhere. Well, I'm not happy about this at all. Not at all. Time is money. You've already started your lumbering operations on my land, and I'm expected to wait for the money. Oh, Mr. Giblin, I, I'm not asking for, for a year's extension. It's just a couple of days, and I hope that you think that I'm good for it. <laughs> I'm certain of that, Mr. Cartwright. However, I uh, shall expect reasonable recompense for allowing late delivery of the lease money. There'll um, have to be certain alterations in our contract. Uh, what are you suggesting? Well, I've no wish to be hard on you, Mr. Cartwright, but uh, business is business. Shall we say 25% uh, of your gross on the operation? 25%. <laughs> Mr. Gibbon, I thought you used the word reasonable. What you're suggesting is highway robbery. Take it or leave it. Well, that's the way you're going to put it, Mr. Giblin. I will leave it. And I will leave your land tomorrow. You'll pay damages. Reasonable damages, Mr. Giblin. Reasonable damages. Did you ever fly with Riley in his wondrous gas balloon? Up 
and over the lovely city by the pale light of the moon. No, I've never flown with Riley because I can plainly see that living the life of Riley might well be the death of me. Now <laughs> try it, will you? All right, everybody. Right, here we go. You ever, ever fly with Riley in this wondrous gas balloon? Over the lovely sea by the pale light of the moon. No, I've never flown with Riley because I can plainly see that living the life of Riley might well be the death of me. <laughs> Thank you, my darling. When I look at you, I feel 30 years younger. Oh, Papa. When I try to get up, I feel 40 years older. Well, old man, let me help you. Oh, oh, there we are. Bring on the red coat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That was fun. But I think I could do with a breath of air. Uh, you know, you I was just, just about to suggest... Just... Shall we go? <laughs> Excuse us. Well, how delightful to be escorted by two gentlemen. <laughs> mm. Well, I can see why you're so proud of her. She's beautiful. Just beautiful. There she is. That she is. It's a lovely evening. More than I deserve. Oh, it's a grand evening. Do you ever fly with Riley in his wondrous gas balloon? No, I, meant, I meant to ask you. What? How did you get along today with that Mr. Giblin? Oh, Mr. Giblin. Uh, not too well. <laughs> but don't worry. Somehow we'll work things out. Tell me the truth. Didn't he give enough time to raise the money? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, he did. And all he wanted in return was 25% of the gross. <laughs> Why, that crook. Yes, that's what I thought, too. You're not going to do business with him under those circumstances. I'm not going to do business with him under any conditions. I'm pulling my men and machines off his place down tomorrow morning. That'll cost you a pretty penny. Well, it'll be cheaper in the long run. Ah, it's all my fault. Oni, let's talk about something pleasant, shall we? How about a brandy? All right. All right. Giblin. with Riley, because I can plainly see how living the life of Riley might well be the death of me. Did you ever fly with Riley in his wondrous gas balloon up and over the lovely city? If you plunge your arm into this little black bag, you will find not a snapping frog, but $114,000 in cash. You say you're looking for some profitable business venture in which to invest your money? Yes, I am. You've come to the right place, Mr. Dugan. I thought I had. By the way, will you call me Oni? Uh, regarding my investment, Mr. Giblin. Uh, call me Hubert. All right, Hubert. Uh, I think that you have a building here in town by the name of the Golden Horseshoe. You're that white elephant. Oh, yes, 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 yes. A sturdy structure. Well, I see you have that rare ability to realize the business potential of the place. I'm glad you see it that way. It makes it easier for me to propose the partnership that I have in mind. Now, you provide the building, and I will use this entire sum to make a grand and elegant place. With the proper financing, it uh, just might be quite a success. With what I have in mind, it'll be packed. It'll take a man of vision like yourself to make a go of a place that size. A man of vision, yes. What's better than myself? Someone more experienced. I have a father in New York. He's run a place like twice that big for years now. He'll be taken over. Father, you say? <laughs> well, no offense, but uh, isn't he a trifle old to be working? <laughs> there is no substitute for experience, right? <laughs> There, you make the offer sound most attractive. And we'd split the profits, 50-50. Right down the line. All right, I'll drop the uh, partnership agreement right away. Just one thing. Now, I may have to loan this money temporarily to a friend of mine before we go into business together. His name is Cartwright. Is that uh, Ben Cartwright? Do you know him? Uh, we've met. Well, then you understand that he keeps things to himself. But I was able to find out that he'd made a bad lumber deal. He has to pay out an unfair portion of his profits. Now, I may have to force this money onto him in order to help him get out of it. 
It just so happens that uh, I have some uh, influence with the timber interests here. I just might be able to prevail upon them to be a little bit more reasonable, Mr. Cartwright. Well, in that case, I wouldn't have to lend that to him, would I? And we could proceed with our little business agreement. Exactly. Onward and upward, as they say. <laughs> Arnie, you talk my language. Hubert, I should. I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> well, shall we get to this partnership agreement? Good yeah. idea. I have it right here with me. Signed there. I don't know what kind of a tree you fell out of, but I can guarantee you're a nut. How can I take a job chopping trees if I'm going to spend the next ten years in jail? Well, that's an interesting question. Now I've got one of my own. What have you got against the Cartwrights? Oh, I don't know. It's... It's, well... It isn't easy to say. Well, think deep about it. I still don't know. When I'm sober, I don't seem to mind them too much. Ah, well, why don't you try staying sober for a little bit? Well, I could try. All right, then. I'll withdraw the charges against you. I'll straighten things out with the sheriff and the judge. And I'll arrange some kind of a parole. Well, you hear what I said? I hear you, but I don't believe you. Why would you do this? Well, it's not an easy thing to explain. It has something to do with... Balancing the books. There's something to do with casting the first stone. And something to do with the fact that a man by the name of Patrick O'Neill can't be all bad. I'll drink to that. Arnie, it was nice of you to get Patrick O'Neill out of jail. And, you know, of course you were right. He wasn't, he wasn't intending to kill us. He was drunk. But do you really want me to hire him? Well, you said yourself he was one of the best logger foremen in the business when he was sober. Ah, exactly. When he was sober. And he hasn't been that in a long, long time. He'll change. A man may be down, but he's never out. Well, all right. I'll hire him. But the first time he's in trouble on the job, I'll have to get rid of him. I don't think he will. But you sure are right about people changing. You know, yesterday, that fellow given, I wouldn't have given a dead coyote for him. And today, he gives me all the time I need to pay him what I owe, no penalties attached, all free and clear. He's a changed person. He is? Well, I never. Hey, yeah, you see, you give people enough time and they'll mend their evil ways, as my grandmother used to say. <laughs> well, I gotta get me an early start. I'll see you in the morning. Help me, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, look at that, will you? You know, we don't have trees this tall in the east, but we've got more squirrels per square foot. Now, if Ireland had, had this much timber, we'd have overwhelmed the English with our shillings. <laughs> Only, pull a little jewel over here. Aye. Who's that, Poppin' Jay? He happens to be a very good friend of mine, that's who. Any more questions? Not with the answers you give. Well, then, let's get on with the work. You better have the men clear the lower slope first, huh? Yeah, that'll make it easy to skip the logs down from the upper ridge. Yeah. Men! <laughs> well, Arnie, yeah. how are you? <laughs> yes, your men are as busy as a pocket full of bees. Yeah, they sure are. And that Patrick, how's he working out so far? Oh, he's, he's doing great. Great, he's a good foreman. Because I just can't figure out how he managed to hire every Irishman in town since this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't trust him. He's from the north. Now, you forgive me, I've got a bit of my own business to do in town. And I'll see you, though. Right. Hey, what kind of business is Oni getting? Well, I don't know, but that Blarney, he's going to get through it without much of a struggle, I'll guarantee. I <laughs> may. I think, however, that he's going to have a bit of a struggle on his hand, just the same. Uh, with what? With himself. With himself. Hello, Oni. 
It's a nice day. It was a nice day. The sight of you two would chase a snake up a rope. You don't really mean that. We've been kind of worried about you, Oni. Let's go over to the saloon and have a little drink. Come off of it, Tierney. I'm here as a retired gentleman, rich and respectable. What would I be doing with the likes of you? We're simply fellow New Yorkers you happen to meet. Uh, interested in a little friendly business conversation. Yes. Uh, you want to be friendly, don't you? I do not. Well, extend yourself. Oh, well. Uh, anything you need, Mr. Dugan, just call on me. Thank you, Bruno. <laughs> and I, I must say, you're a big man in town, only. It's royal treatment every time. That's because I'm not shanty Irish like you. Uh, Bruno can sense the royal blood in my veins. Sure, Roni, sure. It may seem a bit unfriendly, our checking up on you like this, but the organization's a little nervous these days. There's a new atmosphere back home. What with the reformers sticking their sharp blue noses into everything except a man's morning coffee. Tweed himself was worried about the last report. The boys would like to check on the current state of their um, investments, is the word we use. What's that got to do with me? Well, you took a hundred odd thousand dollars out of New York to invest it in some honest enterprise with your friend Mr. Cartwright. That was with the boys' approval. What about it? You didn't invest it with Cartwright. You deposited it the Virginia City Bank. Not only was the money deposited, but you've been withdrawing big chunks of it in bank drafts. Why? Well, uh, I think you two deserve some answers, and I'm going to give them to you. Now, I tell you. You recall that big saloon in the corner, the one with the handsome pillars? You mean the one that's vacant? The same, only it won't be vacant long because I'm taking it over, and it'll be the biggest in the West. That's your investment. It is. So you see, I couldn't ask Cartwright to go in with me because he knows nothing about it. So I went big with Giblin. <laughs> and I must say, Oli, you never did think small. That's what the bank drafts were for. I sent for the equipment, and it took almost all of the $114,000. But it was worth it. I'm starting on the inside first so that we can open sooner. Good thinking. I thought you'd see it my way. I'm sorry if we uh, appear to be a bit rough on you, but, uh, well, that's our job, you understand. And I, uh, I really want to say it, and I mean it from the heart. I'm glad we didn't have to tell Julie about your misguided past. Of course I understand, and now you can report that only Dugan has made the smartest investment in his life. Schlanter. 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 Good day, gentlemen. The saloon business. The golden horseshoe. Golden horseshoe? <sighs> Only when I... When I heard that you'd bought that saloon, I could not believe my ears. On your own deathbed. You confessed to me that that money that you had was stolen money. It was tainted money. And the moment you find out that you're not going to die, what do you do? You buy a saloon with it. I didn't buy it. Well, whatever you did with it. You don't understand, Ben. No, I don't understand. Now, will you kindly explain? Well, I can't do it yet. You will have to give me one week. Only I have... Darling, darling. Ah, you should have been in bed uh, hours ago. We were just talking over a little business, Ben and I. Nothing you'd be interested in. You didn't hear us, did you? Do you think in all these years I didn't know what you were doing? The stolen money, the deals, the payoffs. You must have misunderstood. No, Papa. I know everything. Everything? Yes. Oh, my friend. You may think it's strange, but I wish I'd been killed by that bullet. It'd be less painful than this. If only I had another week. 
Do you think in one week you could make up what you've done in a lifetime? Oh, no. But as my grandfather used to say, I can try. After all, it only took six days for the Lord to make the whole earth. Well, it's the owners missing breakfast together this morning. Yes, fifth day in a row. I heard him leaving when I was getting dressed. No can understand Mr. Tukin. At first, all time late for breakfast. Now, too early. Huh. Then I Looks like he's gonna go ahead with the saloon, huh? Sure does. He's very serious about it. Let's see if we can get up to the lumber camp. Man! Man! What? Hell! My week is up! I want you to come into town with me. Town for what? My shipment's coming in. And this is the last favor I'll ask you. Now you come on, will you? And will you bring Patrick O'Neill with you? Will you? All right, yeah. all right, I'll do it. Better get Patrick O'Neill. Come on, let's go. Well, today's the big day, eh, partner? That it is, partner. That it is. And here she comes now. I can hardly wait to see our equipment, Oni. Undoubtedly the finest marble top bar, cup crystal chandeliers, plate glass mirrors, piano, and rugs as thick as bearskins. <laughs> I can't imagine an operator like you buying second-rate furnishings. I didn't. Be assured of that. Here we are, dear girl. Fly with Riley. All right, man. Hello. Take the covers off there, will you? That's an altar. It is. What's this all about, Mr. Dugan? Now, call me Oni. Well, where's the fixtures? You ordered for the saloon. Saloon? I don't recall guaranteeing that there'd be a saloon. What was all that talk about your father coming from the East to run the place? Well, not my father, a father. Father O'Brien, and a very fine <laughs> man he is, too. Don't you try to cheat me, you crook. I own half of this place. I've got a paper to prove it. But it's my investment, too, and I say it'll be a church. It's a long way from being a church, and you know it. As far as I'm concerned, it's a saloon, and it's going to stay that way. And I say that it'll be a church. We'll see about that. All right, see about it. What are you staring at there? Give him a hand, will you? <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> oh, my darling, darling, it's the least I can do. Hey! Go on! Pitch in, will you? You know, this is the church you'll be attending from now on. Unless, of course, you intend to go back to New York and give Boss Tweed a full progress report. Hey, hey. Oh, right. Uh, there's a bit of equipment that's been long time needed around here. And I hope you'll be spending a good deal of time in it, Papa. I will, I promise. Cartwright! Mr. Cartwright! Giblin's been tearing around town hiring every tough he can find. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all. He's the type who'd steal a dead fly from a blind spider. I guess he tends to make good on his threat. Well, we're not gonna have too much longer to find out. I told you I'd be back, Dugan. We'd not have been disappointed in the least if you'd failed to keep a promise, Mr. Gaboon. That's Giblin. I'm a man of action and I'll not be cheated. All right, men, you know what I hired you for. Everything goes back in those wagons. 
You're a smart man, Mr. Gibbons. And you'd be smarter still if you'd buy these poor young men a drink and not let them get their heads broken. Walk right over the top of him if you have to. He's only one uh, man. Mr. Given? Does it make any difference? And besides, my friends there, it may interest you to know that it wasn't for nothing that I hired the firm of Duffy and McGee to do me hauling. I'll double your pay. Now get in there and get him. Let's get him! Now that that's over with, is there any further business matters you'd like to be discussing with me? The church is all yours. <laughs> there we are. I want to thank him. Didn't I tell you he was a tiger in the street? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how can I ever thank you, gentlemen, for the magnificent help you've given me over the last oh, three well, weeks? Looks wonderful. There comes my father. Remember, my daughter Julie? Yes, yes. Julie, oh, bless your heart. Hello, Father. Now, these are my good friends, the Cartwrights. How do you do, gentlemen? Father, how are you? I, I, I've got to be admitting it, Tony. It's every bit like you said it was in your letter. Indeed it is. Now, about the church. We haven't even started on the outside yet, you know. It looks like the devil. But the inside, it looks like heaven itself. Sure, anyone can tell at a glance. It's a fine, upstanding, peace-loving town. <laughs> which nobody can deny, my friend. Which nobody can deny. Uh -huh. <laughs> Come along, Father. Oh, did you ever play? Which nobody can deny. <laughs> <laughs> Clibbership fellows appreciate the trouble we go to to harvest this ponderosa pine. <laughs> I don't know. You reckon us cowboys appreciate all the effort it takes to get our pants closed all the way from Boston to San Francisco? That's a good point. Hey, come on. Will you, powder man? We're waiting. I'll have this thing dug up before you get it blown up. You boys take cover up there. They're going to blow this stump. Give me a shovel full of dirt. Get up. Oh. Easy does it. The date tonight.
He's alive. Oh, yeah. The others turned pale right off. Hey, Hollis! Get down here with that wagon! Yeah, tie that off. So you can slow up the bleeding before I take that stake out. Before noon tomorrow. Buddy, you might as well make up your mind. You ain't gonna be riding with that lady sometime. There's a horse auction over there tomorrow. There's a black, the only one in the string, and I got to have him. This leg's more important than any horse I know of. Where's my kick? I have money. I'll take it easy. I don't have any blasting to do for a couple of days. I'd be delighted to go to Rimville and take care of it for him. Rimville is not just over the next hill. It's a long ride overnight. <clears throat> well, you know, Pike, I could go along with Candy. You could keep an eye on him. Oh, well, he could keep an eye on me, too. First time you've volunteered for anything in over a month. You know what? That's the reason I'm doing it. I, I feel kind of guilty about it. I got plenty to do here. There's five hundred dollars in there. Five hundred dollars for one horse? Was he made of pure gold? I got to have that horse. He's the only black in the string. I got to have him. Don't worry, we'll get him for you. Just take care of that leg. got into this mess, but that land was posted for blasting, Mr. Fredericks. How'd you know my name? Looked in your wallet. Want to notify your family. I got no family. But thanks for trying. I like made it just in time. Yeah, here's 30. Mm -hmm. 30. I'll uh, take care of the horse. Yeah, here's 30. Well, here's 30. No. Good animal here. You're missing a chance. I got 30. I got 30. Well, here's 35. 35. 35 going once, twice, three times, and sold to the bow legged cowboy for $35. Tommy, let's get that good looking black one in here. Ha, 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 ha. 
$250. Exactly $200 and no cents. If he's worth $200, he's worth three. I hear three, don't I? You just heard it, $300. You just bought yourself a horse, Fred. I've got $300, we'll hear more. $350, going once, twice, three times, and sold for $300. Pay the tally and collect your bill of sale. Three hundred. Well, I'll try to get a hold on him. Why anybody wants to buy him, I'll never know. Good luck. Try to get a rope on him. Take care of the Uh, next animal is one you can last soon. <laughs> here you go. Bartender, when does it uh, liven up around here? Mister, this here is Rimville. Yeah, they call it Rimville because it's right on the edge of nothing. It place I saw coming in that hotel, is that the only place to stay? Yeah, across the street there. That's what I was afraid of. Oh, sometimes things liven up about sundown. I can hardly wait. excitement over the hotel. You know, I bet the chambermaid will be 72. As a matter of fact, he is. Four hundred. Hundred dollar profit. I'll take the bill of sale for the black. Uh, that's uh, sure a nice profit, mister, but... Uh, uh, sorry, I'm not interested. Double your profit. I'm Gabriel Bingham. 
And I want that horse. I don't um, remember you inviting anybody over here, Joe. Did you invite anyone over here? Hmm? No, I didn't invite anybody. Did you invite somebody? Well, I didn't invite anyone over here. Hello, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bingham, but I, I can't sell a horse. It's not mine to sell. See, it belongs to a fellow who's in bed hurt. And to hear him talk, that's, that's the greatest animal in the world, so... Sorry. Hey, cowboy. Did you know who that was? Hmm? Oh, yeah, that, that's Gabriel Bingham. He likes black horses. <laughs> I got a strange feeling our exciting night in Rimville has just come and gone. Joe, give me another look at that bill of sale. Well, that's just a bill of sale. I got me curious. I must have missed something when I looked at that horse. No, I counted four legs and a head. Hey, bartender, what do we owe you for the uh, the champagne, the pheasant under glass, and the dancing girl? Huh? The bill, please. Oh, oh, uh, uh. Two dollars and six bits. Mm -hmm. I'm going back over to the stable and taking another look at that horse. All righty. I'll be up in a room figuring out exciting stories to tell Brother Hoss when we get back. You see, that was two and six bits. Yes, sir. Yes. Hey, uh, buy a beer for the lady. Hold it right there. Put that horse right back where you found him. You hold it right there, mister. Drop your gun. Go ahead. Get your hands up. And turn around real slow. All right, boys, get the... and close the door. Um, Ma'am, I, I think maybe I have the wrong room. Just come in and close the door. to believe you. I know Chase wouldn't let anybody buy that horse for him. Look, lady, if you would just try telling me half as much as I'm trying to tell you, I think we'd get along fine. I explained he had no choice. He gave us $500 to buy a horse. We spent $300, and I've got $200 left over. Now I know you're lying. Chase never had $500 in his whole life. That's a use. Why don't you just admit you work for Bingham? Work? Lady, I wouldn't work for Bingham if... What the heck happened to you? You said he was 70. Yeah, I was wrong again. What happened? Over well, 35 very bad men hit me in the head and took that black away from me. Who's your friend? She hasn't said. She's been too busy calling me a liar. Come on, sit down. What are you lying about? I'm not lying. She just thinks I am. She's got an idea we bought that horse for a Bingham. Bingham? Well, now, that's going to be very easy to straighten out. You give me a couple of minutes to get cleaned up. The night's young. There's wine and music next door with the ladies. Shut up. She's not very friendly, is she? Mm -mm. Now, show her the bill of sale, will you? They got that, too. They got that, yeah, figures. You have any idea where they went? I didn't notice. I was taking a nap. 
But I did get a good look at one of them. It was that uh, ramrod that was bidding against us at the auction, the one with a scar on his face. His name is Rio. He's Bingham's foreman. Oh, Bingham's foreman. So Bingham's foreman steals a horse from us that we paid $300 for. Now, you still think we're working for Bingham, or are you beginning to believe what I've been telling you? I guess I was wrong. Please, take me to see Jace right away. It's very important. I'm sorry to say this, but you're going to have to go without me. I'm going to be busy. Yeah, well, hold on. You're going where I think you're going. You need help. Lady needs an escort. I'll get that horse. Please, take me to see Jace right now. All right, first thing in the morning. If you'll do me one little favor. What? Put the gun away. <laughs> We're gonna find the sheriff. Uh, it depends. What you want to see him for? Well, I'm gonna go try to catch a horse thief. Thought he might want to come along. This uh, stole horse, that wouldn't be the black you and your friend bought at the auction yesterday, would it? Could be. It's too bad. But I recollect Mr. Bingham offered you and your friend one fair price for that piece of horse flesh. Could be. But uh, that doesn't give him license to send his foreman to steal it. Son, you take my advice. Don't accuse Mr. Bingham of anything you can't prove beyond a shadow. Don't need advice. Just directions. Well, fair enough. No advice. Where's the sheriff? Your beer's lousy, too. Get him here. Well, that ain't just a horse, Bingham. He's half horse and half pure devil. Maybe. I took a few punches getting him, too. But you aren't done yet. I told you to bring in Jace, too. Well, how am I gonna do that? I don't know where to look for him. And you call yourself smart. Took me one minute with a hotel clerk to find out it was Joe Cartwright bid in that horse. Cartwright, huh? And Cartwright himself said he bought him for a man who's hurt and in bed. Well, the Cartwright's got that logging camp up near Sawtooth. So, start there. But find him real, and bring him in. How do you want him, Mr. Bingham? Dead or alive? Yeah. Dead or alive? <laughs>
No? Too bad. Killing you here would save the time and trouble of hanging you. For what? For coming after a horse that I bought and paid for? You got to build a sail? Walk. Where? Where I can keep an eye on you till the law gets here. Sure we should go for that gun. Man kills a horse thief. He's doing the world a favor. So if he's here, he'll be in the bunkhouse. Get back in those saddles and ride! While you still can! Hold your fire, Jace. We'll leave. Camp. They were trying to kill Chase. Yes, dear. That's what I mean by becoming involved. But one of those gunmen was killed. Ran out the door here. And one of my men was wounded. Now, I'm going to have to explain that to the law. Before I can, you're going to have to explain it to me. It started six years ago. Pa broke his hip. He was bedridden after that. My uncle, Gabe Bingham, ran the ranch. He was supposed to teach me how to run it. But all I was ever allowed to do was clean the stables and dig post holes. I'm a fair hand with horses. So I took to the high country, chasing the wild ones. I met Kathy. My father and we decided to 
throw in together and build a horse ranch. I need money to get started. Throw in to Pa. He said chasing wild horses was like chasing the rainbows. Well, a lot of men feel that way. And uh, yeah, these father and I started to train. A black caballero. How did you know? Well, J.C. was a little feverish, and he did a bit of talking. A horse that can round up other horses is worth a lot of money. This is the best one you ever saw. Anyway, to make it short, Pa died. His will said that I didn't get the ranch until I was married, settled down, in a business of my own, making money. That's why I needed the caballado. That's why Bingham stole him. Tell him the rest. If anything happens to me, Bingham gets the ranch. Mm. Jason, you gave Joe $500, huh? Where'd you get it? Out of the ranch safe. Back wages, Bingham wouldn't give me. He'll say I stole it. It's Chase's money. He earned it. You don't believe me? Well, son, it's not a question of believing or not believing. I think I'd like to go over and talk to Bingham. I'm right over there with boys. Staying right here. You're in no condition to ride anywhere. Kathy, you stay here with him. You stay here till the legs better. Oh. Perhaps you'd like some. Chase, what are you doing out of bed? I'm wasted too much time already. I'm all right. Darling, you're just not well enough yet. I'm going, Kathy. I got to be there when Bingham talked to Cartwright. I want my own rein on that caballero. Hand me my gun, please. I need my horse. I'll saddle mine up, too. Kathy. Cartwright. I'm looking for Mr. Bingham, please. Oh, Mr. Cartwright. I've always wanted to meet you. Mr. Bingham, won't you come in? Well, we should have met long before this, Cartwright. I don't know why we didn't. Sit down. What do the three Cartwrights prefer with their branch water? I always think men can look at things better through a glass. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bingham. But I suppose your men told you what happened over at our logging camp. No. Oh, I didn't send anybody over there. I don't know what this is all about. Yeah, well, let me explain it to you. You tried to buy a horse from me for $600, I wouldn't sell him. So you sent your man Rio to steal him. Now, you watch who you're calling a thief, boy. 
I saw you weren't going to sell, so I passed. Rio? Yeah, he's a thief. But he doesn't work for me anymore. I caught him stealing. Threw him off the place more than a month ago. How come that he and two of his friends came over to try to get Jace Fredericks out of our bunkhouse? Jace? Oh, he's staying with you? Yes, he is. That loco nephew of mine. What did he tell you? That I don't treat him right? That I'm trying to steal this ranch from him? First thing he tells everybody. Did he mention that I took hold of this ranch when his paw was crippled? That I worked freeze and drought, flood and dust, and built it to where it is today? Yes, he said you ran it. Without his help. Well, but he wouldn't mention that. That boy never did an honest lick of work from the day his paw was hurt. He run off every chance he got. And he's a thief, too. And I can prove it. Sheriff? Yes, sir. Why did I ask you to ride over, Sheriff? To, to investigate a robbery. What did you find? Oh, it's a pretty bald-faced fact of Mr. Bingham's nephew. Jace Frederick stole $500 out of the ranch strongbox. Well, who told you it was Jace Frederick stole the money? Well, uh... Let me ask you a question. How much did Jace give you to buy that black? Five hundred dollars. There you are. I'm having that drink. Invitation still open. Mr. Bingham, how do you know it was Jace who gave Joe that five hundred dollars? <laughs> shooting rats around the barn. Now, as I was trying to explain... We can't let them leave this ranch. We? No, 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 here, j just a minute. I, I don't mind telling a lie or two, but killing that... Come on!
rifle, I'll kill you. Looks like this town's in a hanging mood. Sure does. That lucky Andy Buchanan, engaged to the banker's daughter, doesn't have a penny to his name. Oh, Andy, I wish you didn't have to testify. It's my duty. Of course it is, Eleanor. Now, Mr. Buchanan, You've stated that you and Hoss Cartwright heard cries in the night and that you rushed up to where Shirley Patrick, this newcomer to Virginia City, was being assaulted, murdered, and you saw a man leaning over her. Do you see that man in this courtroom? Yes, sir, there's no doubt in my mind. That man, Frank Scott, killed the girl. That ain't true! He's a liar! Easy, easy. Silence in the courtroom. Mr. Cartwright, you ran to the scene of the murder with Mr. Buchanan, and you also saw the man that killed Shirley Patrick. Now, will you tell us, who was that man? Well, I was standing sort of behind Andy, and I couldn't see too well. But, I, well, I think it was... Mr. Cartwright, the jury is not interested in what you think, just in what you saw. Now, was it, or was it not, Frank Scott? Well, like I say, I couldn't see too well, but... Well, it, it looked like Frank Scott, yes. It wasn't me! You're lying! You're lying! You're lying! He was home, with me. And he couldn't have killed Shirley Patrick, could he? No, sir. Frank is innocent. He's not guilty. You're a witness, Mr. Monroe. <clears throat> Mrs. Scott. Isn't it true that your husband was arrested just last month for beating you? At that time, didn't you state to Sheriff Coffey that you were deathly afraid of him, that he might kill you? I object. This has no relation to the case at hand. Sustain. Mrs. Scott, aren't you lying out of fear? Didn't your husband tell you what to answer? Well, we talked some, but he didn't tell me. No further questions. 
We find the defendant, Frank Scott, guilty of murder. And therefore, it is the judgment of this court that you shall hang by the neck until you are dead. May God have mercy on your soul. I swear by the good book, I didn't do it. I... I've done some mean things in my life. But I didn't kill no girl. The jury is dismissed and this court stands adjourned. Come along, Frank. Good job on the stand, Andy. Very convincing. I'll do my duty, sir, same as you. I tell you, it's hard to see a man sentenced to death, even if he is a murderer. First time I realized a man could be killed with words. Forty more of the finest acres in Lake Tahoe. I think we ought to celebrate, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. think after all the work I put in closing this deal, I think I, I kind of do deserve a celebration. Thank you, Father. A beer? Yeah, beer. This one's on Little Joe, Paul. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, Joseph. Awfully good of you. Huh. Think nothing of it, Father. <laughs> Hey, you know, that we own Miller's Creek, maybe we can build a flume to, uh, to South Patch, huh? Now, wait a minute. One thing at a time. We just bought the property. Well, I know we just bought them. We're going to do something with it, right? Two cars. care what you've been telling me. The man that killed that girl has already been hanged. We've heard all about the trial. Sheriff, sure. I was a witness on that trial. And we made a mistake. The law says the case is closed. And until you can bring me hard proof, not just say so, we got nothing to talk about. No, Sheriff. And that's the end of it. Forty dollars. $20. Two cards for me. Where's the sheriff? Well, he said he wouldn't arrest anybody without more evidence than we've got. Thank you, gentlemen. That does it for me. Little lady, that's for you. I'm going to be by here in the next couple of weeks, and uh, you better be here. I'm going to go get him. Hold it. What for, mister? The money I just won in there? You must be out of your mind trying to rob a poor country boy right here in front of God and everybody. I'm making a citizen's arrest for murder. <laughs> you? Who are you? And suppose you tell me who I killed. You killed a girl in Virginia City last July, a pretty girl. Or she was until she ended up with a broken neck. You out of your mind. You got no right and you ain't gonna shoot. I never been to Virginia City. You've been there once. If you're going back. Paul for sure. I'm gonna take him in. You better talk some sense to this fellow, mister. He's biting off more than the whole lot of you can chew. He knows what he's doing.
We'll bring the horses around back. Up. You've got yourself a rattlesnake by the neck, mister. And you ain't gonna be able to let go, not even a little, without you winding up dead. Outside. Take him inside. Yo, take the horses over to the livery stable. I'm going to see the prosecutor. Don't push me. Sheriff, I'm sure glad to see you. Now, this fella here, he's robbed me of my rights as a law-abiding citizen. Horse, if I wasn't seeing this in my own eyes, I, I wouldn't believe it. He's a spitting image of Frank Scott. I saw him in Carson City in a saloon. Made a citizen's arrest for killing Shirley Patrick. A pack of lies. I've never been in this town before. Now, what's the sentence for false arrest, Sheriff? Why don't you just sit down and we'll iron out some of these things? Tell him, big fella. It's your party. His name is Mel Barnes. I found him over in Carson City. He looks identical. So I look like somebody. What's that mean? Sheriff, I want out of here now. I'm going to make more trouble than you ever saw. Hoss, I'll admit that he looks like Frank Scott's twin. But you and Andy here have already testified that Frank Scott was the killer. Roy, you can at least hold him until Paul gets through talking with the prosecutor, can't you? Looks like I'm gonna have to. Not so fast, Sheriff. You ain't heard my side yet. Now, you're gonna have plenty of time to talk. Well, what's the charge? Suspicion of murder. That ought to be more than enough. Come on, right through them doors there. I was sure it was Frank Scott. I see this Mel Barnes. Hoss, how can you be so sure? Andy, do you remember that strange tune we heard whistling that night? Yeah. It was Mel Barnes. I heard him whistling the same tune over in a saloon in Carson City. That'd be a big shock to a lot of people. Now, you feel dead sure that Barnes was a killer and not Frank Scott, huh? Yeah. What happens now? Well, it's all spelled out in the law. There'll be an indictment and another trial. Roy, we made a terrible mistake. And we're ready to take whatever blame comes to us. It's just not that simple, Hoss. The judge, the jury... Prosecutor, most everybody in town believed that the right man was tried, sentenced, and hanged. And they're not going to like having their noses rubbed in that mistake. Now, you thought that what you was doing is right. But this is one time I sure am glad that I'm not standing in your boots.
been quite a day, hasn't it? Rumors, excitement. You know, quite possibly a new trial. Now, if a mistake was made, and I say if, mind you, then as foreman of the jury, uh, I share the responsibility to a small degree. But I share it, Andrew. I made a mistake. Did you? Yeah. Or are you just being influenced by all the excitement and the rumors? No. The reason I ask, as foreman of the jury, I heard and considered all the evidence. Now, if I had thought a wrong verdict had been reached, I wouldn't have been able to sleep a single night since that trial. But I've slept like a baby, Andrew, every night. Barnes could be Frank Scott's twin. I never saw anything like it. <laughs> the odds against him being here in Virginia City at the very moment of the murder are they're so vast as to be incredible. On the other hand, we know Frank Scott to be a thoroughly detestable man, given to drunkenness and wife beating. And he was here every day. I thought of that. I'm not trying to influence you, Andrew. But I must say that a banker's reputation is his most precious possession. And we are both bankers. See, people expect us to be right to make the correct decisions, not just part of the time, all the time. People lose faith in us. They lose faith in the bank. All I want is for you to do what is right. Last question, Mr. Cartwright. Are you sure beyond all doubt that Mel Barnes killed Miss Patrick? Yes, sir. Your witness, Mr. Belden. Mr. Cartwright, would you mind going through your fantastic tale once more for our amusement? Your Honor, I object. We'll rephrase the question. Tell us your story, Mr. Cartwright. Well, I was in Carson City. In a saloon? Yes, sir. Drinking? One beer. I didn't ask your capacity, Mr. Cartwright. <laughs> <laughs> Silence in the courtroom. Like I said, I... I was in Carson City in a saloon, having a beer, and I heard this whistling. And it was the same whistling that 
Andy and I heard the night that Miss Patrick got killed. It was a strange, funny sort of tune, one you'd never forget. I see. You heard this whistle, and immediately you knew that my client was guilty of murder. Well, that is what you're saying, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's too bad Frank Scott isn't available, so that he could whistle for us in rebuttal. Now, Mr. Cartwright, you are telling us that in a fair court of law, 12 citizens of Virginia City, an able defense attorney, an impartial judge, you are telling us that all these people made a mistake and sentenced an innocent man to death? At that first trial, you were certain that Frank Scott was the murderer. At least you did not deny it. Now you are certain that Mel Barnes is the murderer. You say you made a mistake once. Why not now? Simply because my client looks a little like Frank Scott? Simply because Mel Barnes likes pretty girls and whistles? That's all, Mr. Cartwright. Sorry, Hoss, you'll have to step down. calls Andrew Buchanan. Mr. Buchanan, you've already been sworn in. I have only one question to ask. Is the defendant, Mel Barnes, the man you saw attack the Patrick girl? No, sir, Mel Barnes didn't do it. Silence in the courtroom. Like I said before, it's Frank Scott. Now, Mr. Buchanan, Horse Cartwright mentioned a whistle. Do you know what he meant? No, sir. Maybe he was hearing things. There was no whistle? Then there's no doubt at all in your mind? No, sir. No, no, none at all. We convicted the right man. The court finds the defendant Melvin Barnes not guilty. You're hereby released from custody. This court stands adjourned. Thank you, Judge. You've done a good job, fella. <laughs> That friend of yours, he plumb tuckered himself out on the stand, didn't he? Didn't even say goodbye. Now, you're going to see how that rattlesnake I've been telling you about can bite. I was on that first jury. I'll tell you, we didn't make no mistake. <laughs> uh, compliments to a friend. Hey, what do you know? Some guy over there's buying. Hey, you're famous. Thank you kindly, friend. You gonna stay around a while, honey? Well, as long as there are free drinks to drink and pretty gals to hug, I'll be around. <laughs> now, you play your cards right. Now buy some diamond earrings to dangle off them pretty little ears of yours. <laughs> Diamonds from a cowpoke? Oh, I'm gonna have lots of money from Cartwright. You see, my lawyer tells me that my good name's been hurt and my life's been put in jeopardy. That's worth a lot of money, honey. <laughs> Oh, what a 
we have here? Well, the future Mrs. Andrew Buchanan III, about to shop for her trousseau. It's over, Andy. It's all over. Don't even think about it anymore. Yeah, sure. Darling, you've done what you know is right. The trial is over. Why, after Saturday, we'll be a married couple on our honeymoon. That's right. And we can both forget the whole thing. Oh, I know it's been a terrible strain for you. Daddy says how well you handled yourself. Well, that sure takes a load off my mind. Andy. I mean it. Don't think about any of it. From now on, just think about us. Mmm. If I had known this is what goes on in banks after hours, I'd have been here more often. About as hot as it was in court. <sighs> Heavy as you are, you must feel the heat worse than the rest of us. You're on the Ponderosa barn, you ain't welcome here. Is that neighborly? Here I am, coming in hot and dusty, longing for a cool drink of water. They got water in Carson City. Well, would I leave while I still got some unfinished business? Like I said, you ain't welcome here. Well, I figure I'm welcome, as long as you owe me $5,000. When I collect, I'll just get out of them. I figure that's a reasonable amount. I hate greedy people, taking more than they deserve. Can't stomach it myself. You ain't making sense to me, Barnes. Well, I just want to leave Virginia City feeling like I've been justly treated. Now, how do you think that judge is going to feel when I bring you into court? For putting me through all that misery. Do you know what he's going to do? Yeah. He's going to throw you out of court just like I'm going to... He's going to say if that Barnes fellow had been found guilty, his poor neck had been stretched tighter than a bark on a tree. Can't write that there judge is going to give me money like I never heard of. The 5000 is cheap. I said get out of here. <laughs> I don't think you quite understand the lay of the land. You see, it don't matter a hill of beans whether I killed anyone. I mean, even if I did it, they can't put me on trial again. I'm asking a lot less than most people would say I deserve. But 5,000 is all I need to get to Colorado. Always wanted to see Colorado. They say the mountains are red over there. You believe that? And they got pretty girls in Colorado, so they tell. Soft, with pretty yellow hair, nice little ears, nice white throats. Five thousand shiny gold ones. Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> let him parade around the streets like an innocent man. He's a killer. Look, will you stop jumping around from one place to the other and just sit down? Come on, I'll sit. The law seemed fit to convict and hang an innocent man and to acquit a guilty one. It isn't justice, I agree, but it was accomplished through the due process of law and we must accept it. Well, I don't care how it was done. It ain't right. 
It's an injustice, huh? Fine. Well, I've seen plenty of injustices in my time. And most of them have been corrected. Oh, I know that small comfort after the deed. But in the fullness of time, the guilty usually pay for their crimes. Well, oh, I, I find that pretty hard to buy. All right, what am I supposed to do? Just give him some money, pat him on the back, and send him on his way? Oh, come on now, you're talking nonsense. You're right. Think on this, though. He's a killer, Paul. He's walking the streets free, and he's going to kill again. Then what are we going to do about it? Of course, the laws aren't perfect. And neither are the people who execute them. But we've got to have some guidelines to live by. Now, most of the time, they serve us well. This time, they didn't. But we're still going to abide by the law, as all civilized human beings should. I wanted to thank you for trying to help Shirley. Shirley Patrick? She knew you? Because I'm a saloon girl. You think she was Miss Morning Glory, all sweetness and light? Well, maybe she was in a way. She hadn't learned to be as tough as me. We worked in St. Louis together. I wrote her to join me. She arrived the week she was killed. That's why no one here knew who she was. I was at both trials. And at first I thought it was Scott, but now I know you're right, Hoss. Mel Barnes killed her. Gladys, you know you're probably the only one down there, believe me. Well, I know men, and I've been around him for a while. Mel Barnes, he doesn't like women. Deep down, maybe even hates them. He's strange. He's crawly strange. Do you want to see him put away? Well, so do I. How? I know how to handle him. I'll get him up here, get him drunk, and then get him to try to hurt me. Gladys, you can't do that. He's dangerous. But there'll be somebody close by. Then he'll be caught in the act. Then everyone will know he killed Shirley. You'd be taking a mighty big chance. Gladys... He's a killer. Not if you're the one who's close by. I'll be there. Oh, Nellie, it's so sweet of you to stay so late working on my wedding gown. Well, we have to have everything ready for Saturday, don't we? It's the happiest day of your life. Let me see the cap, dear. Oh, there's something the matter with that. Let me fix it. Oh, fine. Uh Mm, you're a sweet gal. 
Hey, your glass is full, honey. Right, right, right. Can't have a full glass. <laughs> Mm. You got the prettiest little ears. Anyone ever tell you that before? One or two. <laughs> mm. uh, uh, we got a whole half bottle left. Mm. You want to drink first? No. <laughs> oh, just one more drink first. Hmm? What's wrong with you? Nothing. I'm... Just a little jumpy, I'm fine. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> What's gotten into you all of a sudden? Nothing. I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. Something's wrong. It ain't right. Here, have a drink, man. Take it to bed with you. Bye. Oh, man, oh, come on, honey. I'm tough. I really am. I know men. I'm sorry, but when he touched my neck... Here, have a lousy drink. Oh, it's kind of late. You ready to go home? Yeah, I'm about ready to ride. Boy, I need to see a fellow first. Oh, wait a minute. What do you want to see? Andy. I'll be right back. I will be right here waiting. It's just beautiful. Thanks again, Nellie. I don't know what we'd have done without your help. I've been looking forward to this ever since you had pigtails and skin knees. <laughs> I'd have been hurt if you hadn't asked me. Are you going to be all right walking home alone? Oh, I'm meeting Andy at the bank. He's working late, too. Thanks again. Pleasant dreams. Good night, bye. Eleanor? I'm busy, Hoss. Andy, you're not too busy to have a minute with me. I, uh, I got a lot of work to do, Hoss. I got... Andy, they're just figures. They'll wait. Look, will you stop? We convicted the right man. You know it, I know it. Now leave me alone. Yes? You haven't been right since you came back from Carson City, you know that? I think you're losing your mind. You're going out of your head, so stay away from me. Just stay away from me. Yes? Uh, who is it? You're the best 
Fournier, go ahead, fight! I like it that way! She's dead. all I ever loved, Hoss. And I killed her. <laughs>